Our text today is read from the second chapter of the letter to the Hebrews, beginning with verse 14 and reading through chapter 3. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. For death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. We have read that Christ destroyed him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. According to the scriptures, Satan prior to the death of Jesus Christ, had what the Bible refers to as the power of death. In what sense did Satan have the power of death? What did Jesus Christ do to break that power? First of all, Satan had the power of death in the proposition of life that faced mortal man under the Old Covenant. All that man knew prior to the resurrection and the regeneration and the recreation was the old world, the world of the children of Adam, the world of mortality, the world of humanism. And that world, early on in the experience of the human race, disappointed and failed man and let him down. You want to go back and read in the Old Testament, you can find the ancient men of the faith beginning almost at the outset to cry out against life. Man's days are evil and few, Jacob the patriarch said to Pharaoh, who asked him of his age. The ancient prophet wrote in the Psalms and said, Man that is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. Man is born to trouble, said Job the ancient patriarch, as sparks fly upward. Just as surely as sparks rise in the air from the fire, so trouble will settle in upon the life of man. So said Job, the ancient honorable man. Solomon, a man of whom God himself confessed there was not a wiser humanist born in this world before, nor said God, will there ever be again. We're talking about humanism now. We're not talking about the new creation, the redeemed mind. In the mind of the Spirit, we're talking about philosophy, insight into human nature. Solomon, according to the Bible and according to God's own statement, was the wisest man that ever lived. In my own life, one of the greatest turning points came when I finally got around to facing up to and listening to the message of Solomon. Solomon wrote a little book called The Ecclesiastes, and that rather long and pretentious-sounding word means the preacher, the words of the preacher. Now Solomon wasn't a preacher in any contemporary sense. He didn't have a congregation. He didn't meet every Sabbath and give sermons to his congregation. Solomon meant this. He said, I have a message to tell the world. I've got one great message to give to it, and you'd do well if you'd listen to me because I'm the one who knows. If you studied the life of Solomon, you would come to the conclusion that as a humanist, as mortal man goes, this was indeed correct. Solomon was the wealthiest man that ever lived. He had wealth that beggars the imagination. So rich, says the book of First Chronicles, was the kingdom of Solomon that silver was nothing. It was like rocks in the street. It wasn't accounted for anything. If it wasn't gold, if it wasn't diamonds, If it wasn't emeralds, Solomon didn't want it. And Solomon was a great patron of the arts. He had the peculiar treasures of kings. He collected 
things from all over the world. He had great orchestras and great choral groups and built phenomenal and uh, buildings and painted great paintings. And Solomon was very cultured. Solomon was a great architect. He built the Hanging Gardens, one of the seven wonders of the world, and constructed irrigation systems and all sorts of things. Solomon was a great warrior, many chariots, thousands upon thousands of chariots and horses, literally millions of soldiers. Solomon was a great ladies' man. He had 300 wives and 700 mistresses of the most beautiful, fascinating, interesting, and exotic women of the world, and I'm not going to comment upon that except to say that Solomon was a great ladies' man. And it might be interesting to you to know that all of these women that Solomon had were volunteers. Solomon never forced his attentions upon any woman ever. He never put a rope on them or brought them into his harem against their will. It was a prestigious thing. If you want to know how the women of the world felt about Solomon, read the Song of Solomon and see what chance they made about this man. And Solomon was a great philosopher. And this man said, and also Solomon was a great religionist. We don't want to leave that out. He built the temple, and he was a man who loved religious things and loved at least to talk about God and his greatness. And Solomon said, I have one great message to preach, and I want you to listen to it. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vexation, vanity and vexation of spirit, and there's no profit of all the works that a man takes under the sun. If you want to put that in contemporary language, it's this. Everything is empty. Everything is meaningless. Everything is a mirage. Everything is a lie. Nothing brings any satisfaction. Nothing does a man any good in the final analysis. That was Solomon's evaluation of life. Remember that this was not a bitter man. This was a man who'd been there and seen it all and done it all. And the Bible says of Solomon, Solomon said of himself, I withheld from my heart no joy. I had the power to do it. I had the money to do it. I had the kingdom to do it. And so prestigious was the kingdom of Solomon that kings of the world actually fought for the privilege of making themselves servitude to Solomon and coming and sitting at his table. Once the queen of Sheba, a great African leader, said, Oh, nonsense. These rumors get started and the man gets, the legend gets bigger than the man. I don't believe all this stuff about Solomon. I'm going to go down there and take a look for myself. And so she went, and Solomon showed her around and showed her everything she wanted to see and told her everything she wanted to know. And when she got ready to leave, she said, You know, Solomon, I didn't believe this report when I was in my own country, but I've got to tell you now that the half was never told. She said, I, I never heard any small part of it. I thought it was an exaggeration. It was an understatement altogether. It's impossible to believe Solomon, what you've done here. So when you listen to Solomon, you're not listening to a little man who would like to have done it but wasn't able to. You're listening to the most successful humanist that ever lived. Solomon said, in fact, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he said this, you read it. In fact, he said, life is so meaningless that it isn't even a zero, it's a minus. It's worse than nothing. Solomon said, so negative is life that the man who is never born and never had to go through it at all is better off than the man who is dead, who in turn is better off than the man who's still alive and still suffering through it. Well, all this is by way of showing that the proposition of life under the Old Testament had nothing to offer, and men, holy men, great men, wise men, knew it. They were out there grubbing for it, fighting for it, pushing like hogs at the trough in order to try to get it away from the other guy, and all the while they knew that it wouldn't do them any good. They were going to grow old, 
They were going to lose their youth, their zeal, their drive, their enthusiasm. They were going to grow cynical. The things of youth were going to fail to thrill them anymore, and eventually they were going to die. That fear was in man, and still is in man, who does not know the new creation, the fear of death. And because that knowledge was there, and because man under the Old Testament was an existentialist and nothing more, he went only by his experiences and what he could see and sense with his sensory perceptions, he was intimidated. Satan could intimidate him. He could harass him. He could cause him to feel like a failure. Man under the Old Testament was cynical about the proposition of life. And because he was, he feared it. He was skeptical about his own inabilities. He was resigned to failure. This is what Job said when his trials came upon him. He said, the thing I feared has finally happened. Just like man today who experiences disappointment and failure, and he says, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it was too good to be true. Man is cynical and he has learned to accept failure. He's resigned to it. And death has terror over man. Man feared death and was in the bondage of it because of his fear of the unknown. Because he's an existentialist and because he can only cope with what he sees and feels and tastes and contacts with his natural senses, he has a fear of the unknown, and death always brings us face to face with the unknown. When we think of death, we think of the unknown when we are afraid. I can always tell at memorial services as I conduct them through the years, the people who are not close to God, who are not right with God, or who don't know God, you can see the fear in their eyes as they look in that coffin and see that dead person laying there, and death is never more real to them than it is then, and they're afraid because they're afraid of the unknown. And that's all man could be before the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection. Now there are other possibilities. Many have not taken advantage of it, but at least they're there. But before the death of Jesus Christ, they weren't there. Satan had the power of death over man. It is too bad that many non-Christian people today who are not justified still live in the fear of death, even though it isn't necessary. And it is equally unfortunate that many Christian people who are justified but are not sanctified still live their lives in the same way, still trying to get the old things still trying to achieve the false world, and still living in that frustration and fear that inevitably comes to the man of the old creation. And remember, remember this, never doubt it for a moment. Religion, part of humanism, is a failure. Religion is part of the old and is a failure. Now Christ took away the bondage that man was in because of the fear of death. How did he do it? He did it first of all by refusing the proposition and exposing the lie. Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness when Satan said, Jesus, you're hungry, command these stones to be made bread. Man, you've got to have bread. And Jesus said, no, I don't. Satan said, yes, you do. And Jesus said, no, I don't. Because it's written, man shall not live by bread alone. What did Jesus say to the devil? He said, the proposition is a lie. My greatest need is not for bread. You see, mortal man doesn't know this. He says, I've got to make a living. I've got to have things. I've got to, I've got to have materials. And Jesus says, that's not your greatest need. That's part of the lie of the old proposition of the fallen world. Sure. Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of some of these things, but to be intimidated by your material needs, to allow your character to be distorted and warped, to allow yourself to be pulled away from your beliefs and your 
convictions because of your fear of not being able to make a living is false. Jesus proved it was false. He proved it by refusing to bow to that kind of pressure. And Jesus said, let me tell you something. A man's life does not consist, does not consist in the abundance of things that he has. That's part of the lie of the old world. We're in this world, we've got to make a living, we're going to make it by the sweat of our face, but it is a lie to suppose that that is so important that we can let it distort our character. It is a lie that Jesus exposed. And Jesus showed the ability to overcome all these pressures from the old world and humanism of the Holy Spirit. And Pentecost gave that power to us. Jesus took away the bondage of sin and the, or the bondage of death and the fear of it by teaching the desirability of death as a means to a better life. Teaching the desirability of death to the old nature, the pride, the selfishness, the rebellion, the faults and temporal goals that men strive for as a means of achievement. Jesus said his faults die to those things, and death, which is an end to the humanist, becomes a beginning to God's men. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, Jesus said, it abides alone, but if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Death, which is an experience that all mortals will go through with, in other words, can be used to the advantage of those who will die to the old and be resurrected and be born into the new to deliberately bring on this death of the old nature in order to have the new nature is no longer an enemy but a friend. And when we understand that, and when we see what the resurrection of Jesus Christ really meant, death loses its fear. And when we lose the fear of death, it no longer has any bondage over us to rule us. And Jesus took away the fear of death by showing the reality of the hope. He showed it in the resurrection. And Jesus was resurrected. He was seen, said St. Paul, in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verse 6, by more than 500 of the ancient early church fathers at one time. To deny the resurrection would be to call every one of the ancient holy men that began the Christian movement a deliberate liar and a deceiver. That's what you've got to do if you deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because when he was in the world for 40 days after his resurrection from the grave and before his ascension, he was seen by many people and as many as 500 of the early leaders of the Christian church at one time. Jesus showed that death has no bondage and no fear because in the resurrection there is new life for the spirit there is a reuniting with God, and there's new life for the soul, a purpose that death cannot take away from you, mortal man can't take away from you, governments can't take. Remember what Jesus said when they said, why don't your servants fight to deliver you? Jesus said, because my kingdom isn't of this world, and you can take my mortal life, but you can't take away the life that God has given me. You can steal what rusts and corrodes and corrupts in this world, but you can't take from me the true riches that do not wax old and that never pass away. And Jesus gave new meaning to life, life on the eternal plane that nothing that is mortal can touch or can take away from us. And Jesus Christ, through his own physical resurrection, showed that there is new life for the body. And when we put these bodies in the grave, and lay them down to rest. It's only a resting place. There is a resurrection day coming. And St. John said in the fifth chapter of John's Gospel, the graves will be opened and the dead will come forth. As we see the resurrected Christ in the great book of Revelation, we see the reward. He has gone to his reward. Well done. And he is set down at the right hand of the Father. And we see then what we are taught as children what we lose somewhere along the line, coming back to assert itself a firm reality, right will triumph in the end. Death cannot destroy righteousness. All death can destroy is the unrighteousness, 
the unwholesome, the false ambitions, the old sin-cursed body, the evil things that are going to perish anyway, right will triumph. It will triumph, not because of the moral principle in humanism, but because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and the destruction of death, which is the ultimate triumph of right. Now this new life, this uh, deliverance from the bondage of the fear of death becomes effective through our faith. And we're talking about biblical faith now, real commitment. As we're using the illustration of the Jordan River and the children crossing over, if you read in the third chapter of Joshua in verse 13, you would read God saying to Joshua, when the soles of the feet of the priests touch the water, I'll roll back the river and let them through. Following God with no alternative, death, committing ourselves wholly to God, not a humanistic kind of a shopping for something better, but a total commitment, an abandoning of the old and a setting sail for yonder shore with the realization that life holds nothing without God and God will not let us down, and he won't. And this becomes effective for us through the high priestly work of Christ in two senses, one to make reconciliation for our sins and the failures of our life, as we read here, and that means to take away anything that would become a barrier to fellowship with God. Christ is at the right hand of God and can do that based upon his work on the cross. And then to help us around the problems. Jesus Christ is the one who underwent these experiences clear to death, and did it perfectly, and did it without failure. And so, as the file leader and the captain of our salvation, he can lead us around these problems too. Wherefore, holy brethren, consider him. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father in heaven. Blessed are they that do his will, for they shall have the right to enter in to the gates of the city. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven and bags that don't wax old. The kingdom of God and its righteousness is of excelling value. Man has something now to give himself to in which there is no death. Through the grace of God and the giving of the Holy Ghost, there is no failure. There is no end. There is eternal future. This is what Christ, the captain of our salvation, can lead us to. And we go on in the book of Hebrews then to study about the cross and its meaning. What Jesus Christ did on the cross to make this great salvation, this sanctification, this delivering of our lives from the power of sin and death available to us through him.